Anyone? 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 I'm missing the presentation. Okay, 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 okay. It's small, so it's okay. I was thinking the best thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, you need from the next one's Yes, yes. <laughs> Do you need one of these? Sorry? You've got it. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So I guess it's 10.02. Um, what you should have, if you go into the presentations folder and look at the index file, is something which looks like this, which says copy the USB key and pass it on. Has anyone not got a copy of what's on the USB key? What is that USB key? <laughs> Have you got a copy of what's on the USB key? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you see the instructions file? Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. <coughs> what is it for is for the deep learning workshop, which you're at, okay. on a rainy Saturday morning. Okay. So in, in this, if you just do a right arrow, you'll have... Um, some of these things, basically there's the main presentation. You don't actually need to follow along in that at all. Um, there are links to something which I'm calling cat painting. There's another to TensorFlow, um, which is a playground application. So these first, first two examples here are JavaScript, which are gonna run without needing the virtual machine at all. And then there's this whole virtual box thing, um, which is for the real, real meat of it. Um, I think this is just me. Okay. Um, so this, this morning is going to be broken into two halves. The first is from 10 to 11, which will, is labelled core by the organisers. Um, so it's going to be less hard than the hardcore section which comes after the break, which is um, from 11.15 to 12.30-ish. Um, we'll see whether there are people hanging around. I don't know. Um, I have to leave by 3. I, I don't, we'll, we'll get chucked out at some point, so... Um, if so, his presentation. So, this is a deep learning workshop. It's labelled hardcore. Um, this is the kind of to dissuade people who didn't have laptops and couldn't install a, the um, virtual box thing. Uh, th th this is not for them. Um, so, just a quick bit about me. Um, so, I've moved to Singapore in September 2013. 2014 was basically just me having fun. I had zero clients, I had um, a home office, and I just did machine learning the whole time. I guess the reason I did that is back in the early 90s, I did a PhD um, in the UK and in machine learning. So after that, though, I went into the kind of quant finance thing, moved to New York, lived there for a long time. Um, but now I've decided, OK, I should do what I actually want to do, which is machine learning. So I had a lot of fun during 2014. 2015 has turned into like serious mode. Um, I actually have a proper client, a local <coughs> Singaporean company, and I do natural language processing with them, which involves some deep learning, a whole bunch of cool stuff, and it was a good switch. Okay, so this first, so in this first hour, which is gonna be simpler, um, I'm gonna go over some of the history I'm going to, well, very quickly, I'm going to go over what, what's doable, um, then we move on to kind of very understanding very, on a rudimentary level, the kind of mathematics which we're talking about, then having a look at what a natural network does, then playing around with other networks, and then I'll actually show a sample from the, um, from the appliance thing. Ah, 
So, rather than sneak in and avoid you, you need one of these. Can we get one of these? I doubt it. Um, so I sh and then I'll also show you other stuff which is on the virtual machine because there's actually quite a lot of content which we, there's no way in which we can cover this. Um, next week I'm actually I've been invited to India to give a six-hour thing, so maybe I can grab more of it there, but uh, it, that's full already. So, um, so in the second part there are going to be two essentially kind of modules which people can take more seriously. Please pick up a USB key at the front because you'll need it. And so we can, that will be much more hands-on. Um, I will try and keep, unless people really want me to, I'll try and keep my talking to a minimum so you can actually play with it yourselves. Okay, <coughs> so let's get going. Deep learning, basically what we're talking about is neural networks with multiple layers, re regularly fed with lots of data. Um, back history-wise, this has been around for a long, long time. Um, in the 80s, people thought this was kind of one of the answers to the whole brain thing, um, and thought that there, you know, this is going to work, and we're going to map the brain, and everything's going to we'll have AI any time now. But what happened in the, the mid 90s is that people discovered that it didn't wasn't quite so easy as all that, and they had problems solving very very simple toy examples, and everything just kind of uh, AI winter set in. So, going forwards a decade, you get there was a big improvement. People suddenly realised that if you had deeper networks and bigger networks, things started to work again. And forward another five years, people then discovered you could train these things on GPUs. So GPUs are obviously for graphics and for gamers, enable which basically you're using uh, processing of a lot of polygons, which is essentially matrix math and People discovered that NVIDIA had this whole um, environment where you can actually program these, and now people have built layers upon layers of programming environments, so the GPUs are what powers this stuff. Now, in your own machine, you might have a GPU. Though I, I'm not, I see a lot of apples, which is fine. Um, but the VM doesn't require it, and it's all timed so that these things take about five minutes to train at most. So, but. Trust me, the GPU would be useful if you're doing this to any, any large extent. So the, the list of kind of who's involved is a list of who stuck with it from the mid-90s. Um, I did not stick through it for the mid-90s. I took a vacation in finance. And the interesting thing is that now, if I'd have started one of the like modern networks, um, training it back in the mid-90s, it wouldn't have finished yet because the computer hardware has advanced so quickly, it was actually worth taking a 20-year holiday in finance, right? Come back, and now I can afford a GPU card which will run it overnight. So um, here, here is a list of, of kind of, of some of the key players. Hinton's a, a huge name from way back. He was taken up by Google. LeCun um, is, is the inventor of CNNs, so Facebook. Um, Andrew Ung, who's popular from the Coursera course, he's a Baidu, um, doing a, a lot of their natural language processing. Apple has been acquiring things. Um, there's, there's kind of one standout from the, the original area called Bengio, who's still at Montreal and has a, a large group there doing you know, excellent university tile work. On the other hand, a lot of these companies are publishing. Prime, Google is one of the main people publishing this stuff, and they've been very, very open about this, and they've been producing excellent software, um, more of that later. So here's a quick overview of what deep learning can do now um, in areas such as speech recognition, language translation, recognition, captioning, reinforcement learning. This stuff is, uh, is stuff which the, particularly the, like the speech recognition and language translation had come to an, as kind of a, an asymptote in terms of the training. When people were making small increments of a you know, on some various scores of like a percent a year or something. And then the deep learning guys came along and essentially threw away all of the elegance that people have been developing in, say, linguistics, and just trained the thing off tons of data. And suddenly, scores went up massively. And 
this is one of the reasons why people are so interested in it, because of its effectiveness. So on the speech, re speech recognition front, um, since Jelly Bean on an Android phone, um, they've been sending your data up to the cloud to do actually your uh, speech recognition. However, since Lollipop, which is 2014, it's actually taking place on your phone. So you're, if you've got an Android for phone for sure, there is a deep learned neural network inside, which um, all these latecomers are going to want one of these USB keys and tr not avoid looking at me. <laughs> okay, fine. You will soon find out you need it. So. Okay, so my, my guess is that the uh, Apple also has this stuff. Um, they are very much less open source about it. Um, there's translation. So Google have got deep models um, which are on the phone, I believe, whereby they can look at images and translate on the fly into the picture. Now this, coming from, say, the 90s, this is insane technology which um, is now doable. So it, it's incredible that it, it actually picks up the fonts. It's, uh, it's this crazy stuff. 26 languages, insane. House numbers. So this is what, um, when you're doing recaptures, you've been giving Google uh, training data for their house number recognition algorithm. So typically in a capture, you'll have two boxes, one of which will be a fairly recognizable number, another one will be a fairly un a less recognizable number. And what they will do is they'll say, well, we'll, we'll detect whether you're human on the things we know, and we'll record your response on the thing we don't know, and then you're providing validation data the whole time. Now, if they're not sure of something, they'll just ask another 10 people, because Google can do this at Google scale. Right? So they have a huge, huge training set of this. The interesting thing is that they, they can measure how good humans are at it, because they can cross-validate. Um, they're better than humans at this thing. Um, so this is, sorry, this is used for street maps. So that's the point. You're going to want a USB key. <laughs> So, <laughs> it's a very interesting psychological experiment. What I found in Singapore is I will get all the keys back, which is super, right? And everyone will refuse them as well, so it's uh, funny. Now, one of the other things which has spurred kind of innovation is there's a big competition called ImageNet, uh, where, and, and I'll talk more about this in a bit, it, they have huge numbers of images which people are trying to classify into a thousand classes. And because there's this competition every year, people can gauge how well everyone is doing. And big companies, because they want to attract good people, pour lots of, um, lots of development time into this, or lots of GPU time. Um, and this is, you can check, I mean, there's some guy called Carpathy who actually verified for himself how good was he at classifying these images. And so the neural network stuff, better than humans now, or better than Carpathy. It's, uh, it's, kind, of, it's kind of interesting. So th this image net is actually very, it has a lot, of, um, a lot of classes across a whole spectrum. Also, we've got might and container ship and motor <coughs> scooter. But it's also got a very, um, very detailed stuff about dogs. It doesn't have much about cats, but it has lots of dogs and lots of flowers, I think. So that they have a sp either going for a broad spectrum of things or some very narrow definitions. Where humans miss out is distinguishing between the dogs, because it's very difficult to distinguish between these things, and, um, well, the, the networks tend to get the hang of it. Captioning. So this is something which is done um, by Google. If you just have random images which you've snapped at a party, or if I took pictures here, it would actually be able to put labels on them. Because they have Google scale data of labels and pictures, they can then say, well, what label would someone generate for this? And I'll describe how this is done in the second half. Um, some of these are pretty good. Some of these are not very good. Um, you can have a look at exactly what's going on. For, for instance, um, so you can see them in more detail in the presentations one of it. Here we've got a person riding on, riding on a motorcycle on a dirt road, which is excellent. Or a herd of elephants walking across a grass field. Next one across, we've got two dogs playing in the grass. Now, there are three dogs playing in the grass. 
uh, not, not great, or a close-up of a cat lying on a couch. So this is a cat actually on a bed. A skateboarder does a trick on a ramp. It's a cyclist or mountain biker. Um, and then on the last column you've got, in particular this one is pretty nasty, a refrigerator filled with lots of food and drinks. <laughs> so, the, you know, it's, it's, some are not so good. Um, and some are, the, the, particularly the road sign is a horrendously bad mistake. It c could be a horrendously bad mistake. So something else which Google has been playing around with, um, and this is they bought uh, a company called DeepMind in the UK. Um, they want to be able to play games. Now, the reason that they're particularly interested in games is because of advertising, which tends to be, um, the, some of the mechanics of it are kind of like a game because they're playing to maximize their value by showing you stuff. And they know what, you, what your moves were after seeing previous stuff. And so it's a, a question of optimizing what they can do next to you. Obviously, they don't want to, if they give you the same advert again and again, they know a certain percentage of people with certain demographics will eventually click on the advert. Other people will, like, move to Bing if they start doing that. So they, th there's a game which they're playing. Also, they want to test out new adverts all the time on you. So that it may be that if they're showing you one advert continuously and you're not clicking it, they'll try another one on, on the same topic, or they'll say, okay, we'll give you a, a survey monkey, or we, we'll do various other things to you. Anyway, but the nice papers that they've produced have been about um, there's this Atari, it's a nature paper, where they play Atari games. So what they the Atari console was an old console, um, probably the 80s, 70s, 80s, where you have a, a cartridge which you plug in, you have this little controller, um, and it has, it's below VGA kind of resolution which it, when it comes onto your television. Um, but because it's also old and it's all downloadable, um, you can run these machines in emulators on the machine much faster than real time and there's whole open source packages to do all this and you can then essentially embody a game which is playable you, anyone who hasn't had a USB key should find one and not ignore it so you, they can learn to play these games essentially by looking at the screen and playing with the paddle and all, all that they have is the pixels coming out of the screen and the paddle so there are no instructions provided apart from your score is X. And so the, the rule that they're told is play however you can looking at these pixels and improve the score. And from this, it learns to play um, more than half of these Atari games better than humans can in you know, like two hours. So this is kind of very, very interesting um, behavior. For instance, when, when it's learning this Space Invaders, these are tiny pictures. Um, this is kind of different. It looks like a brain, but that's just their uh, visualization. There's, this is just showing um, different styles of play. So if you're playing Space Invaders here, this is like a beginning game. They're taking pop shots. Um, over here, you can see how they're kind of they're clearing out some column, but this is a very unfortunate Space Invaders setup because you're doing this. Over here, this is how to shoot the last guy. So th there's some very... This, uh, this all on its own, without understanding the rules, um, only just by pressing. <coughs> so while you run in front, maybe you should pick up a USB key. <laughs> so this is very, it's very interesting that it can do this. Um, not that anyone needs a Space Invaders playing machine, um, but the fact that this is learnable, that, see games, Games is kind of different from uh, recognizing images of house numbers. Because games, you don't know what you're looking for. You, you know that this, if sometimes a score will increase, but you don't know why it increased. It may be, for instance, when you're shooting the last guy on Space Invaders, you have to time it so that you, so when you get the score, it happened ages, ages ago what you should have done. So there's a whole, the, the training is a very much more, well, it turns out not to be tricky at all. And that's kind of one of the crazy good things about this. Um, and then this is the obvious latest thing this year, is that they did the same with Go. Now, people, 
looking at rate of progress, decided that Go should happen in a decade or two, and suddenly it was doable in like six months. Um, so this was very exciting, and, and in, in fact, the you know th th this this thing has been all, all around the papers. This is actually the mechanics of this is very similar to, to one of the things in, on your machines right now. So. Um, it is, it is in, in some ways, the deep learning thing is surprisingly shallow, and that very few concepts will get you to doing what, the, what everyone else is doing. And part of the reason for the rate of advance is not so much some people understand it really deeply and go really deep into it, is that lots and lots of people are trying lots of crazy stuff, and it's suddenly working much better. Okay. So, on the other hand, there's this AI effect. The AI effect is, as soon as you can do it, people say, oh, yeah, of course my phone understands me. That's obvious. You know. Of course, why, why wouldn't I be able to drive a car by machine? It's just obvious. It's an engineering problem now, which is kind of true. But it's, uh, it's kind of, for the AI people, it's kind of, uh, kind of annoying. Right? Um, but, you know, it's, it's, in a way, it's all good. But, okay. So... Here we're going for some little mathematical content, and this will, is a very light brush across how this stuff works from the basics. So, this is the same stuff as was originally done in the 80s and 90s. Nothing new. Um, things have actually got simpler rather than more complicated. Um, by combining very simple mathematical operations, you build up to something much more complicated, like playing Go or recognizing images. So here is the, the typical single neuron, and this is essentially what all of these things are made of. So at the bottom, you will have some input, which will be a whole bunch of real numbers, or just some features, which are just numbers. Then you'll have some weights, so you'll multiply these numbers by some, some weights individually. And then in the middle, you'll sum them up. And then after that, you'll apply nonlinearity. So, in the 80s and 90s, people were tying themselves up knots, figuring out the best nonlinearity. It turned out to be irrelevant, basically, because you can just take the max of zero and the number. So, you just take the positive part. This is called a ReLU unit for a, um, and this works. And then it's, this suddenly makes it very, very easy to do with any GPU. You're doing essentially this is a matrix multiplier. And the nonlinearity is just a. Please take a USB. <laughs> okay, so this, if, if we had lots and lots of them, turns into a multi layer neural network where essentially all your inputs might be connected to all your next layer. Those and then connected to all the next layer and so on to your outputs. So here we'd have essentially three matrix multiplies um, and some, some of this nonlinearity at every stage. Now the trick is how do we train this? Um, because if we go back to this thing, if I have some outputs and some inputs, it's basically like a linear regression or, or something very similar. In this situation, I don't know what the hidden unit should be. Because in order to get my output, from my input to my output, the hidden units will have some values, some intermediate values, and I have no way of assigning them. Now, one of the, the clearest ways of seeing this is if I commuted the hidden units, the outputs of the hidden of the network wouldn't change. So the actual function would be the same, but the hidden unit representation would be obviously completely different. So um, the question is, how do you make these... Um, these things deeper, and this, this tied up people to a large extent in before the AI winter. So this is should be familiar to everyone here, supervised learning. We pick a training case. Essentially, we, um, we have an input, we know the output, we then feed the input through to find out what we actually get, and then we jiggle around all the little weights until the actual output is close <coughs> to the target. And so how do we jigger them around? We use gradient descent. So gradient descent basically is you have a loss function, which is how bad your whole situ how, how bad your solution is. 
and you compute the derivative with respect to every weight in your network, which in this case we have 3 times 5, which says 15 weights plus 30 plus 6. So we have 36 weights here, plus maybe some bias units. Um, so we would then jigger each of these 36 weights until at each stage my output becomes a little bit more like what I intended it to be. So if I have an image recognition thing saying, is this picture a cat? And my network says dog. I will change every little weight in this image recognition thing until it's a little bit more cat-like. So, so the output switches from being dog to cat. And the crazy thing is, if you give it enough images, that will do the whole trick. So gradient descent. So let's train a proper network. Um, since everyone has installed the USB key, um, let's, what we'll do is we'll play with having layers of different widths and layers of different depths and this stochastic gradient descent thing. So in your, in your presentation thing, which you may have open on your screen, there'll be this cat painting which you can click on. And you should get something which looks like this. Well, it won't have the word simple network at the top. It would have a picture of a cat. That's right. Does anybody... Sorry. Has anybody got a picture of a cat showing up on their screen? Hands up. Anyone who has a picture of a cat. Okay. Okay, got a big void over here. Okay, go, go, go. Does anyone not understand why they have no picture of a cat? Or did they not install anything? Mm. Okay, I'm just going to leave a couple of moments for debugging. <laughs> oh, okay. Anyone who needs install. Please. It's only going to get worse. <laughs> You'll realize, oh, I should have done it an hour ago. It's, like, it's going to really hit you. Okay, so what this page does, this is a, a JavaScript version of a convolutional neural network. I'm sorry, it is called connet.js. So this is actually a simple multi layer neural network. Um, the first one it comes up with is a single layer of some neurons. And if you start this network training, basically what it is doing is it's, you'll see the code for this in the box. And it will tr start trying to fit, um, as best it can, um, stuff into this cat image. Let me do cat image. OK, so here we go. So here, what we've got, we've got four neurons in one layer. And it's trying to predict the color of each pixel in this cat image. And you can see that it's not doing a great job, I have to say. So. Uh, here's, here's a clear example. So here, basically, you can see these four, four neurons are producing four lines. All, and it's trying as best it can to fit into this cat image. If we then try slightly higher, this is a single layer of 12 neurons. So I encourage people to like play around with this. So you can see that a single layer of 12 neurons is doing a better job, but it can only cut up the space with these lines. Um, and it doesn't have any understanding of, of areas or curves or anything like this. This is a very simple thing it's doing, okay, single layer of 48. You can see that as we increase the number of lines you're doing, obviously we're going to get higher and higher. Um, high and high, can say, recall of the image. 
but it's all kind of um, over, definitely overfitting. We have no concept of cap in here at all. But if we keep, say, a fixed 48 neurons and have two layers of them, suddenly what we see, initially we start to see lines, and now we start to see it honing in on areas a bit more. Oh, your computer's way faster than mine. <laughs> really? I'm envious. Oh, okay, okay. It, it should, I'm not doing anything special on this machine. Okay. okay, so you can see that um, two layers is quite, quite a lot better. If we go to four layers, so this is still 48 neurons. Um, the number of connections is different. But now this takes a while. But gradually, this thing will start. And you can see that there are curves in here. It's starting to formulate how to divide up this picture into nonlinear regions, all on its own. Now, this JavaScript is, I mean, there's, there's some matrix math in, in the JavaScript library, but it's all just available to have a look at. I mean, there's, it's, it's very straightforward. Um, you can vary this thing, play around with it, and gradually you'll see this thing converging on a decent cat image. And if you want to go deeper, it's fine. Um, so, what this is really showing. Sure. Uh, I, I just I copied that line multiple times. That's how I did it. <laughs> because I wanted to be able to divide a number by lots of other numbers. So these, add, these multiply up to 48. There was no particular reason okay. that. Um, I found what I, I found that um, I can do a single layer of 12, single layer of 48. This would work you no know, better and better, but still demonstrate the point. So, so okay, let's let's put it in multiple layers. Um, I'm I'm not talking about the um, any particular heuristic for doing that, Jesse. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Right. So, and and again, this is this this is an issue which many people in the 90s thought was terribly important, terribly important in that people wanted to have the maximum expressive power from the minimum size network and were really concerned about um, how to, to, to make it as compact as possible, which also has a kind of generalization intuition. But it's, please, have one of these. Have one of these. <laughs> it has a kind of intuition that the, you know, you'll be able to generalize this better if you have fewer neurons because you're then tying them to, to learning as much as possible about the situation. But it turns out, really, that, it, that throwing more neurons at this is better, and then potentially stripping them away. Um, but more data and, and just bigger seems to work a whole lot better. And there's, there's some um, interesting reasons. And um, OK, well, I'll go into that next, next, next time. Okay, let's, let's go back to the thing. So here, OK, here's, my, here's one I cooked earlier. Here's some. Some simple networks, a wider one, two ply, deep network. So this is what happens if you leave it for some time. And you get a decent picture of a cat. I'm not saying this is a good way of drawing cats by any means. But it's just that it has sufficient, um, just these little linear things, which we saw were terrible. If we had the same number of neurons arranged as lines, which would be a very linear type kind of model, versus when it can learn its internal structure. <laughs> Thank you. Once it can learn this internal structure, which it can do on your machine in JavaScript, like um, th this is this is a step up. Okay, so now let's have a look at what's going on inside these networks. Um, so one of the things which uh, one of the issues when you're learning this data is what kind of input features can you use, and also what features are being learned at every level. And then how does the, tra the curve of training work? Because what we saw before was just it getting better and better. Um, the training time and how this thing, thing looks is actually kind of important. So on your, in your presentations folder, on this thing, there's a TensorFlow thing, which you should be able to click to, which I believe I can click to. Does anyone still need to install the stuff? So what we have here, and this is a, a, Google, a Google JavaScript thing, um, 
which is kind of is kind of advertising for their actual TensorFlow library. So what we're going to work on later is a thing called Theano, which is a Python library with um, which has GPU and CPU backend. So obviously, you're, because you've only got CPUs in your machine or on your virtual machine, it's going to be using those. But it will the same code. You switch a command line flag, it will do GPU code as best it can. Um, Google hired one of the guys who did Theano from the beginning, um, and they built this thing called TensorFlow. TensorFlow is a very well engineered Theano, essentially. It's written in C++, it's got all this Google engineering team behind it. Um, on the other hand, Google's machines tend to be rather, for their developers, tend to be rather beefy. So the reason that we're not doing TensorFlow here is because I want you to be able to use all these models. Theano is conservative with what memory it requires. Google, the TensorFlow, it will laugh at your eight gigabytes machine. Right? It, would, it, it was not, it was not sustainable to try and do that. So th these things will run easily with them. If you can load the virtual machine, these things will run, because Theano has a benefit there. Google, on the other hand, they have engineers. They produce this, which is just kind of get people interested in your networks. It's a JavaScript library. Um, it's all open source. Fork it on GitHub. So here, what we have on the left-hand side, we've got an input, some input data, and here we've got some fairly typical, like toy examples. We've got um, blue dots inside other colour dots, and then we have features, which is basically r rather than just working on the image like we did with the cat, we work on particular features, which are either say X going this way, or X going this way, or a bar, or patch board. So there are features which, by clicking on them, you can tell whether this feature is available or not. Then this is that there'll be, you can change the number of hidden layers that you have. So this will expand this in here. And you can change the number of neurons in each layer. Here are two output neurons which will combine to give the, essentially the boundary. And if you press the big play key, So this is kind of, hopefully your machine can do this. <laughs> so, I mean, in a sense, um, this is easy because what my input features, I've got this is an input feature and this is an input feature. And it then uses the hidden units to combine them into these kind of um, diagonal features. And then these two then combine these diagonals into horse shapes and then at the end, you get a you get a blob in the middle. So w w what we could do is is turn that off. So this is uh, this is okay. how about this? So so th th this this you would think could be sufficient. I think this is sufficient. So you can play around with this. I would recommend playing around with this. You can also see that there's a training curve over here. And typically, typically you will have kinks in uh, as it kind of discovers new things it will gradually work its way down. Um, let's pick another. Let's pick, see, okay, sorry. This, this one is fairly obvious, except it doesn't have the same symmetry ideas. So here's an example where it's not getting the hang of this at all because I've given it too few my, okay, of course. So here, the features I've got are symmetric in various ways, which the sample data is not. So these features are insufficient to be able to figure it out. But if I introduce some extra asymmetry, well, let's just get this one. We'll just give the game away. But okay. So here is another classic spiral problem. So th in, in a way, th these toy examples are one of the reasons there was an AI winter, in that people spent a long, long time trying to find minimal ways to do these toy problems. And any time someone solved it, people would point out, well, you helped your network too much um, by giving it the raw data it needed. Right? And it, which is kind of true, but on the other hand, very unhelpful, because it prevented people from then moving on to better better problems. Um, so if, if we turn on more stuff here, 
Okay, I see. <coughs> we can do a better job. Or well, maybe we need some more hidden units. So this may need some playing around with until it until it figures it out. Ooh. <laughs> Come on. No, I mean, anyway, if if you have a machine, which we strongly recommend, has everyone got this? Can they? Can everyone see this? Because we're going to move on. Ah, this looks like a fail. But it, one thing I found is that if, by playing with this too often, is that sometimes you'll get a training which just doesn't get there. And other times it will find it out just nicely. And this is an, a problem being caught in a local minima. Now, to, to, to kind of your question about sizing, is that this local minima used to be a big problem. In that people would say, well, you know, you might, you'll get caught in local minima, let's count the number of local minima, let's figure out the various things. The thing is, if you add a few more neurons, the local minima, essentially you find a way around these local minima. Um, heuristically. <laughs> you, you, you just get more chance at not, being, not having that problem. And so, in a way, people's insistence on trying to make things as compact and efficient as possible was giving rise to a whole bunch of problems that when you get to one of these big networks, doesn't happen because you just throw huge amounts of data and huge amounts of processing power. Now, people were also worried about processing power in the early days, but the reality is your brain, processing is cheap. You've got huge, huge numbers of, huge, huge numbers of neurons in there. Processing is cheap. Um, so, in a way, we should be thinking about how to, if, if the cores were free, what algorithm should we be using? Because the, the brain can do this with very, very little energy. That, so there's a whole different set of arguments about what you should be focusing on, rather than trying to make the network small. Okay. Okay, so this is that. So things to do, if you want to play with around with this, try and find minimal sets of features, minimal layers, minimal widths, and then the disadvantages of going minimal. Okay. So now we're going on to slightly, slightly, slightly bigger. This is the ImageNet competition, which I mentioned before. Um, it consists of 15 million high-resolution images and 22,000 different categories. So basically, they've taken something called WordNet, which is a, a class of, like an ontology of the English language, and they've picked classes from that and said, OK, let's pick. Basically, they choose huge numbers of essentially Flickr images or something similar. Um, and then we say, well, let's get humans to label these in terms of these classes. So they find ones which are labeled with a class. They then check with um, a mechanical Turk people. And once they verified cheaply that this is um, an image of a hamburger or a hot dog, then, th then they know what class to do. So um, this then turns into a huge competition. They have it's a downloadable data set for training, but they also have then a server for the testing. Um, and you can submit, I think, 20 things a day um, to test your algorithm versus, because they obviously don't want you learning the test data. Um, now, companies are very interested in doing this because it's a big thing to win the ImageNet competition now. Um, Baidu, Baidu was caught cheating um, by submitting huge, huge numbers of requests for this and trying, obviously, they, anyway, they were banned for a while, so... Uh, so, so there, there's, the, the stakes are high in some sense, um, even though it's you know, looking at pictures of hot dogs. Okay, so we've got okay, so we've got consomme, hot dog, cheeseburger, and plate. Okay, it's not okay. So, so it's not clear when you well. So when you see this, you, it's probably clear it's a hot dog. And sorry, the images are all pretty small. So this is it's not that it's. You know, if you could see this image more, then you could do a better job. These are all small images, so I can see that this is a hot dog with mustard on. Um, but it's not clear whether it really, I mean, 
you can imagine it might be about other things, but some of these plates are not at all clear. Some, some of these, why are I going to call this a hot dog when it's got a huge plate in it? Um, so some of these labelings are not, not so clear what they should be. And so there are two competitions, essentially, in this one competition. One is, can you get the top one, like your top label being the right label, and the others are the top five, is the right la what they consider the right label in your top five. So <coughs> top five is obviously much easier than top one, and actually top one is fairly debatable, um, even for human labellers. So one, one thing I, I should explain before we talk much more about these image things is about convolutional neural networks. Now, um, with the neural networks, e even though these things do discover features on their own, it, there's, not, there's no reason to say, well, I won't give it any help. I mean, one thing about images is that images are organized. In that, you have up, down, left, right inside an image. And why not let the network know about it? If you just said, here's a bunch of pixels, it would not and you don't give it any hints, it would not know that this pixel is hardly related to this pixel. I mean, as pixels on an image get closer together, they're more likely to be the same. So why not give it that intuition, just hardwire it? So these, the convolutional networks, basically, because you've got this up, down, left, right thing, and translational invariant, or fairly translational invariant, um, what you can do is you can apply a filter, which is pretty much like a Photoshop filter, it's a convolutional filter which you pass over the whole image, which will essentially imagine a filter could be blur, or it could be sharpen, or it could be average, or edge. These things will pass over this and produce another image with those properties. Well, in fact, you pass a whole variety of different filters over it, producing a whole variety of new images with which are either blurred or left sides or right sides. Um, but the parameters of this convolutional thing will be, suppose it's a three by three array, it's got nine weights, but those nine weights will then be applied uniformly across the whole image. So rather than say, well, I've got a whole image of 720p, and I've got a weight for every cell, and so I've got a huge, huge number of weights, and every, every pixel is a special snowflake on its own, this, this convolutional thing, well, I've got nine weights, I'm just going to learn these nine as an average across the whole image. So this is there's a huge, a huge reduction in the number of weights you have to train. Um, on the other hand, you're learning very much less data for every one you do train. But um, this is is kind of one of the secret sources for making the uh, image stuff work. So here's um, like as a matrix operation. Here's what's going on. If you have your your image plane, you then have a tiny little convolutional filter, which then gets multiplied together, summed up, to produce your output image. And your output image will be just a pixel smaller, or unless, or you might assume that there's zeros around the edge, but your output image will be just a bit less data. Um, so now, uh, yes. It's not a separate. You're not doing a separate uh, filter process. No, 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 no. So the, the weights also, everything, everything I, every parameter I mentioned here is probably has a gradient, and therefore will be learnt. Okay, so, so it's a single optimization, basically optimizing everything in a single You way. just, you, you need to find the, this is the crazy thing. You need, for every difference you have in your, in your output versus its target, you need to know the gradient of every single parameter in your model. Now, these may be a long way away from, from the output. So you need some method of figuring out the gradient. And that's where this whole back propagation thing comes in. So, um, but yes, the, the, every, every single parameter here will have um, a, a gradient, and therefore you can train every single parameter. So now it's time to do the virtual box thing. So um, since this is only core, we're going to do this quickly. And maybe. So you need to go, you need to start the virtual machine. And, it, and if you can't make it work, there is a coffee break, so we can make it work. Then you can open Jupyter. OK, there is some data in here about the passwords, if anyone really needs them. You don't need the password. When you start the virtual machine, it will run through booting up a Linux box. Once it's done that, you can then go to your regular browser in the host and go to localhost 8080. 
and you should get a nice thing with a tree on it. So if I put the box. So if you haven't done it already, you would go import appliance. Then find find the appliance. <coughs> This one. So then you accept the defaults. <coughs> so I get the feeling that coffee break may be delayed by 10 minutes. Just anticipating. So here we have. This is the new one which we just added. It's switched off. You can double click on it and it will switch on. So, so this is for Dora 24, which is less than a month old, I guess. Does everyone have this happening? Or, sorry, does anyone not have this happening? Is anyone horribly confused that, that they have no virtual box on the machine? Okay. Everyone needs help. We'll. I think dealing with this during the coffee break is the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone needs help? We'll finish. <laughs> <laughs> so what? What you will eventually this screen will scroll up and you'll get this login prompt. The login prompt is not relevant. This is this is not what you're looking for. What you <laughs> what you are looking for is something like this. So this is Jupyter, um, which is a, a way of running Python notebooks. I'm sure everyone here has either used it or seen it. So what I'm interested in doing is going for this ImageNet Google Net. Google Net. And maybe I should. I'll, I'll give you a quick, so, so here, what you, what you could do is, this, this thing is a working notebook, um, and I'll explain what it's got in it. Google and that is the 2014 entry to the ImageNet competition, or, or like at the beginning of 2014, they published, I guess. Um, this is the number of layers which they're choosing, so it's not a, not a simple network anymore. At the, at the beginning, you put in your, your image, which is 200, like 200 by 200 or so, uh, you go through this number of net network layers, and you get at the end a one of a thousand classification of what that image is. Um, what you'll find, so this is the Google Net thing, if you can step through this this notebook, and just for argument's sake, I will step through this notebook. So if you just press the whatever. So the first cell here is loading up Theano and stuff. And there is a 27 meg um, file of the Google Net parameters, which is pre-trained. And then what is happening here is, and this, this may take a while, is it builds essentially that full network with all those layers and then fills it with the and then the next thing we'll do is fill it with the parameters. Okay. So keeping stepping through, there's a thing which prepares images, because they just need to be a bit of data uh, wrestling. And then here's a picture. We then prepare its image. And we then print the argmax of its output. So argmax here is it's just it, the output of this network is a whole, it's a thousand different numbers and it just picks the biggest one and reports back that this is tabby, tabby cat. Now this is kind of, um, this is kind of amazing in as much as this is, you know, 27 meg, it doesn't, 27 megabytes of data is not enough to store all pictures. This is a random picture of a cat I picked off the internet. So there's not, it hasn't learned this picture. It knows about cats. Um, 
And 27 meg is tiny compared to what your brain contains. So, and in fact, the 27 meg file can be shown that you can reduce this by factors of 10 or 50 just by crunching away the bit resolution. I mean, this stuff is all stored in floats. It doesn't need to be. It can be stored in, like, <coughs> five-bit numbers. And so th this, is, is, you know, this thing can be trained. The reason that you've got a pre-trained network is that you, we would be in a pre-GPU situation training this. This takes um, probably a few days to train um, with using GPUs. Um, and GPUs will be a factor of 10 or, or 10 or 20 on CPU speed on this. So then there's another thing which is, there's an image directory here, it's got a few images in, um, and you can see for yourselves, hopefully, what's going on. So we have Tabby, Tabby Cat, which is okay. We have Golf Ball, which is less good. No, on the other hand, I have to say, owls may not be part of its training set at all. It may not even have a category owl. So it, um, that, I, I, that I don't know for sure, but I, I somehow doubt that it knows what this could be, even. Uh, on the other hand, it does know quite a lot about... I don't know what number four is, the crevasse, whatever. Um, Band-Aid. Now, so, so this is... I think it's been distracted by the text to say it's a band-aid, a nipple, a muzzle, a golden retriever, rubber eraser. So that's not so great. And the last one, okay. Siamese cat. So this is so this is kind of an example of what's running on your on your machine right now. Um, there's a whole bunch of other stuff, and so let me talk about the other stuff. Okay, well, first of all, I should talk about GPUs. The Intel Core, I, Intel Core i7 something is like a thousand dollar chip. It has a lot of stuff. It can do 140 billion floating point operations per second. This is, this is huge in terms of the whole Moore's Law thing. Um, it's great. But we go for an NVIDIA board, which is now a very old board. I mean, because age in GPU is measured in... in each year, we're coming out with something really much better. Um, we can do five trillion flops on, on this. For this, this price is now probably a hundred bucks on eBay kind of thing. Um, so the, the Nvidia has come out with a whole new line. That there's the 1080, the 1060 is like a 250. Or sorry, in Singapore, it's like a 399 Sing uh, board. Um, we'll beat this e easily, and it's probably probably eight. Teraflops. I mean, and then this is when when you look at the supercomputer rankings, the top 500 supercomputer rankings. Number 500 is coming at like 200 teraflops. So these cards, which anyone can buy for a couple of hundred bucks, are say a twentieth the speed of a top 500 computer. This is insane speed you can get for peanuts. And this, I mean, we have to thank the gamers' insatiable need for like. You know, fortunately now there's 4K screens. I mean, that's a whole new level of performance that they need. On the other hand, NVIDIA t does actually take the research community pretty seriously. And whereas the new cards that, that, that they've been... Originally they were looking at people who design air turbines or, or you know, do serious modelling who are very interested in... Or biology or whatever. They were very interested in float 64s, like actual doubles. Um... But the machine learners don't don't even need f float 32s. So they've so Nvidia has now incorporated float 16. So it's 16-bit floats as part of their thing because it means your models can be twice as big, and you know you, you need much less of a GPU to do this. And so uh, some of their GPUs, while they're great for gamers, have got all the features that a neural network people want. Like there's no real need for the gamers to have a 12 gigabyte Titan X. Right? So 12 gigabytes, you don't need that many textures because where do you get them from? It's so, whereas, I mean, maybe some, some people do need it, okay. some gamers who really need it. But I have a Titan X in my machine at, at work, and I have a room full of gamers who wonder why I've never plugged a monitor into it. And, 
And the reason is, this is it's, it's a deep learning thing. It's designed, it's basically designed with exactly what you need to, to learn these models on. Okay, so I'm going to give you, since this is, so we, we're almost out of core stuff now, I'm going to give you a quick overview of what else is in the virtual machine. Um, if you decide not to go hardcore, at least you know what, what's on the thing. So, um, First off, I'm just going to say, well, what, what, what are we going to do? Because this is the data science thing, we're not going to do some of the, say, reinforcement learning. I don't think the learning to play games is probably, well, it may be fun. And, it, and if you really wanted to do it, you could do it while you're here. Um, but there's two things which seem relevant to me, one of which is anomaly detection. Um, basically, it says MNIST again, I, I'll introduce MNIST very soon. Um, this is, a, this is suppose, how do we detect credit card fraud, or how do we detect anomalous signals? Um, can be done with neural networks. I would recommend the neural network thing as is a, is a tool of last resort. Try everything else and then try the black box. Um, the black box can be surprisingly effective, but if you try the black box on day one, then you've lost all, all intuition about how it's working kind of thing. Whereas playing with the data is, is very valuable. On the other hand, if you've no idea how to do it, this thing can work well. So. What the anomaly detection thing doing is, is, is MNIST is a big, uh, uh, is a digit recognition thing. What we're doing is tr we'll try and find out what are the most malformed digits, handwritten digits in this data set. So it, it, if you're trying some linear method or, anyway, it's difficult to see how you would go about this from a normal data science point of view. Um, neural networks to the rescue of this. Another thing is there's a commerce one. So I label this commerce. It's, I think some people will see immediately what this is for. Basically, training one of these big CNN, or one of these big convolutional network networks, is very time consuming you huge amounts of data. But what if you could take a pre-existing or pre-trained neural network and then pass in your images of your classes of stuff, and it could then categorize them into I think this is a, in particular, this one is going to be about cars. So the, 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 these big image net things, cars aren't really, there's grill, I think, it is one of the things we've seen before. But it doesn't really know much about cars. And it's all about dogs, doesn't know much about cars. So what, what I train it on here, I've got a, um, a couple of data sets of old cars and new cars. And say, okay, can we make this network, which is trained mainly on dogs, learn the difference between these cars? And I do that without retraining the network at all. So this is taking all the hard work that Google has done or whatever, or Microsoft or whatever has done to train this network. Can I just repurpose it so I could recognize you know, what kind of car this is, what kind of blouse this is, whatever. So, okay, so this, th these two things, the anomaly detection and the commerce thing are, are coming up in the hardcore section. Okay, but, and, but also on the, on the drive, you can see there's a, this is a 2015 network. So things have got a bit more complicated. This is another Google one called the Inception Network. Um, getting more complicated, scores are better. Um, so there is a, a version of this on the drive. You can have a look, see how it's constructed, play with it. Um, it, w it will do better on the Doge dog or whatever it's like. Um, another way to, pre to abuse these pre-trained networks, which is kind of fun, is you may have seen this deep dream stuff, right? No, it is. If you start looking for this, I have to say, some of these images cannot be unseen. Um, so basically, what, 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 in order to generate these images, people will give it an input image, or maybe even just noise, and say, I want this to be as much like fish as possible. <coughs> and, it will then, and, and then I will optimize the, instead of just optimizing the network, Leave the network alone. I want to optimize the image to make it to make me respond to fish as much as possible. Now I'll put some other constraints on it that I want it to be as much like an image as possible. So I don't just want individual pixels moving to make it a fish. I want a nice image, fishy, and you get this kind of thing happening. Um, it, it, there, there's obviously various various other tricks they do to make them really cool images. Um, what there is on the drive is, or in the virtual machine, is another nice application, which is called style transfer. Um, basically, you can take your own image, in this case, this will be a picture of, now, 
and you can take a style, which will be some <coughs> highly stylized art. So here's, I think you've got Starry Night, whatever, but you can put in Picasso or Cyan or, or whatever, um, and it will recast this thing as that style, and it's kind of cool to play with, and you can do it, uh, there are iPhone apps as well to do this, um, but the, the, the core of it, I mean, when, when you do this on the phone, I believe it's being sent up to the cloud, and they run a GPU on it and send it back. Here you can do it for yourself, um, it takes uh, maybe a minute to, to, to do one of these things on your CPU, so it's, it's not too bad. On the other hand, this is kind of a simplified scenario, working on fairly small images, but there's some fun there. Um, language processing, so we haven't talked about how to deal with variable length things, all of this has been a fixed field. Um, so how do we deal with variable length input? Well, what you do is you have a little network with some parameters, and then you walk it across the input, and you give it a memory of where it was last. So each there's an input state within it which remembers what its last input was. So this essentially, it recursively looks backwards in time. Um, but the thing is, once you step this forwards, and you then say, well, what is the dependence of this parameter back there on my input to my output, I can work out the derivative. And as long as you can work out the derivative, you can train this thing. So here is a simple... So th these networks are getting much bigger now. So this is... Um, and it's still available, it's still in this thing, but it's... People can... Have, you can take this idea of being differentiable into <coughs> being trainable versus um, working. Um, very far. So th here is what's called a, an LSTM unit. Basically, you take your input, and then you have some weight, which will then combine with a gating function, which combine with a, a memory cell, which has a forgetting thing, and outputs from here to produce some output. And then you do this again and again, and because this <coughs> is related to the previous one, these things will all link up, and you can then work out the derivatives through the whole network. And so um, you can play with this. I have to say this, the, the, the example I have on the thing takes too long to train, so this is why I'm not particularly interested. Um, basically, here's a very s a simple example of what, what we do. There's a bunch of poetry on drive. Um, basically, what it, the, the task here is, can I predict the next letter? So if it learns a good model of English language, if I start starting with some, you know, shall I compare you to a, you want an S, U, M, M, right? Um, but basically we've trained it on this poetry to try and output new poetry. Now, when it starts, it's not very good at poetry. So this looks like Pearl or something. Then, and as, as you train it, so you've got 100 epochs in, it's begun to got the idea of, I would say, words. And it's, got, it's come some repetition, or, or some wordish stuff. Um, if we go in a thousand, now it's beginning to much more, much more look like, it's beginning to look a lot more like poetry. Um, not particularly understandable poetry. Okay. If instead we, we run it on a bigger network, a shorter time, but this is Shakespeare's place. So um, here it's begun to understand that people speak in, um, well not, it doesn't understand rhyming, it understands introducing characters and how the whole thing's formatted. <coughs> even, it's even got stage directions, I think it's pretty interesting. It's, th this stuff can, th these neural networks can, or these recurrent networks can learn a whole bunch of stuff. And they can, that, this can then lead into translation. Um, there's a whole bunch of uh, cool stuff you can do with this, but it's kind of not practical to do this on your machine while we sit here. And reinforcement learning. So there's another, this is something because of the whole Go thing. Um, as I said, one of the problems with this is there's no training data. You only train by doing something and seeing what the other person does. So you train the Go thing by either looking at lots of games, which actually they didn't do. They looked at quite a few games to get them to a, a critical level of not being a terrible player, but then they started playing themselves. So optimally you play white, then you switch around and say, okay, well, then I'll play black. 
And this thing, um, obviously, Lisa Doll did not expect it to be as strong as it was. Because the first game, he kind of um, played it like it was an, an amateur um, and was surprised. Then, and so is one of the interesting things about this is after the games, the first one is that the, they would say, well, the computer played a surprisingly good move for a computer. So, okay. The second game was like, well, it made some interesting choices. You know, maybe we need to think more about what it's doing. It's like the third game, which the computer lost, I think, um, when it made a bizarre move, people are saying, well, there must be some good reason why I made that move. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is it? What are the, the gods of Go telling us here? And in fact, it was a stupid move. But, um, so it's interesting how people's perception of this thing has changed through time. And then, you know, it, it was able to, to beat him like, solidly. Um, and now it, uh, there's a, a Chinese guy who considers himself better, um, who wants to play it. Uh, now, I, I guess that Google has not switched off the learning on this thing, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, um, I, I don't know. Obviously, it, we don't want lots of unemployed Go masters, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a noble pursuit. On the other hand, people, you know, two days afterwards, people just say, well, you know, it's a game. Of course computers can play. It's like, <coughs> it's insane. It's, it's not insane. It's like, it's human nature, I guess. So what we have on the drive is actually a version of a thing on here called Bubble Breaker. So Bubble Breaker is like a Candy Crush kind of idea, um, but it's you can anyone can install it. It's free, um, and there's actually a playable version in the Python notebook, which is kind of neat. Um, I've played far too much Bubble Breaker on my thing, and I was kind of curious as to whether there was like a better strategy or whether it could be <coughs> learned at all. One of the differences with Bubble Breaker compared to Go, so, so the, the, the mechanics in the game is if you've got a contiguous block here and you click it, those blocks will disappear. And then the blocks will then fall down to take up the remaining space. If you've got a blank column, new blocks will arrive. So it's slightly different. For, it's a solitaire game. Um, your score is basically like the square of the number of blocks you remove. But you also don't know what's coming in on the left-hand side. So it's not like it's a perfectly predictable game. You have to hope. And, and in fact, it may not be solvable, because you may get a complete domino pattern coming in, um, which you can never get out of. If you've played this game, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, so this is kind of fun. And the thing is, it does, in using my GPU, learning for five hours, it's definitely a better player than I am. And it does some interesting, it has interesting tactics. Um, but you have to really kind of play the game a bit to understand why they're interesting. So, um, I don't necessarily recommend playing this too much, but I see many people playing it too much on the trains. Okay, so pre-break wrap up. I'm sorry, this did take a little over. So, um, deep learning is cool. Some of the hype is probably deserved. Obviously when people are, calling their uh, startups AI, I would say don't do that. Um, this is all, it's all, AI is a, is a distant thing which is worth striving for but is not here. Um, but you can do all of this stuff which was previously completely inaccessible to machines. Um, the next thing is going to be much more hands-on. If you're working on an iPad, it's probably not going to happen, right? Um, if you've got the VM installed and working, then it, there's nothing stopping you using these models and, 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 and playing around with it. Um, there's lots more to, to play with in the VM. This whole thing is open source. So there's a, my GitHub account has this thing called Deep Learning uh, Workshop. Um, please add a star if you like it. Please add a star. Um, and so this has a whole bunch of stuff. And every time I kind of give one of these things, um, then more stuff appears. So. Um, there's also an update script which will enable you to bring what you have up to a higher level, uh, up to the, kind of the, the latest um, level. And yeah, so it's, hopefully it installs properly and everyone can use it because um, it makes quite a nice self contained thing. And break time. There we go. I will now relax. Thanks, Martin.
I will uh, probably take a vote as to whether people just want me to flip through this thing. What I found at previous workshops or, is that people are just happy to watch me doing the thing. Whereas I kind of like people actually interacting with it. So uh, I think that would be better for you kind of thing. So um, I would prefer just to give you an introduction and then to let people have problems and I can run around or if, if there's a commonality of a problem I'll talk about it. Um, okay. So this is now getting harder core because I'm going to explain how this actually, stuff actually gets implemented and works. Um, people use frameworks for doing this stuff. So rather than explain this as being matrix math, um, what you want to do is uh, you say, I want another layer, I want an LSTM unit, I want to do a CNN, I want pooling, I want um, argument, whatever. You, you want to explain the network not as matrix operations. Um, so what but the benefit of doing that is that if you can explain it to the machine what the, the, the scheme that you want, it, can, it then has freedom to map it onto your hardware as best it can. So um, there are a variety of frameworks which people do use. And this is kind of going from the, this is kind of the, the simplest case, the cafe. Basically, you will explain the network as, as, a, as a list in a config file. Basically, you explain exactly what you want it to do, um, and it will then implement this as matrix operations. On the other hand, there's a bit of less flexibility in that they have a predefined number of things you can do, and that's it. Um, Torch is more flexible, um, su supported by uh, Facebook and Twitter, who kind of bought into Torch a great deal. There they have a, you know, another fundamental series of operations, and then you can coordinate them using Lua as a language. Um, now, move, the, but then there's a kind of a higher level version of this, or higher level idea, is this category of Theano and TensorFlow. And this uh, workshop is based upon Theano, which is a Python library produced by the Bengio's Montreal lab. Um, TensorFlow is very much uh, a well engineered version of Theano, um, produced by Google. There's a, a lot of good reasons for loving TensorFlow. Um, but having a small machine is not one of them. So, um, now, sorry, and, and the reason that you want to do this is it can do optimized numerical computation. So what you do is you ex describe what you want to do in Python, and then essentially you, you say, I want um, this network to consist of these layers, and here's my output, and here's my input. And then you say, and then it goes away and takes that and converts it into a big expression tree of the actual operations which need to be done. And then, then it can output code which runs those operations on its own. And if you tell it, I have Blast installed, or I tell it I have GPU installed, it will output the right code for the right platform. It will make decisions about, would it be quicker to do this operation in the CPU, or shall I pay for it to be delivered onto the GPU and run it in the GPU? So it can do lots of, because you're describing it at a higher level, it can make decisions and, and good compiler decisions for you. So it, it outputs, it makes use of NumPy and Blast where it can. It can write C++ for you, or CUDA, or OpenCL. Um, this is kind of a cool library, but it's kind of also been, is uh, an accretion kind of library in that as graduate students pass through the lab, they add the stuff that they need to make it work, and then they leave. And the, I, mean, I think people there would admit that it's a bit kind of has a duct tape feel to it. So um, this is where TensorFlow has been designed from the ground up to be what Theano aims to be. On the other hand, Theano has been working from, sm from a long time from smaller machines. And so they know that they want to keep things self-contained, whereas TensorFlow allocates objects at crazy, like crazy, so. Um, maybe TensorFlow, they actually get to optimizing it, but there's hardly any incentive for Google to do that. Partly because Google has also produced their own TPU now. So instead of ha using the GPU for everything, they have convolutional network ASICs, which they've designed. So they've obviously put in million, they've decided to actually put millions of dollars into building their own piece of silicon which runs on the thing which is the size of an SSD. Um, and so they, they, they calculate that, my guess is they calculate 
that the running cost of this, if you can run it on ASICs, will pay for itself within two months or something, just because they need to run a lot of CNNs, they know the structure, um, they've got that down, they can just blow the whole thing onto silicon, get rid of the GPUs or get rid of the CPU farms. So, um, so Theano Basics, there is a thing in, so this is all going to, this whole thing is all in the um, Jupiter thing. So there's a thing called Theano Basics um, and we're going to press play to run through this thing. Um, let's just kill this one. So I, I'm going to walk through this with you. Basically, the first thing we do is we import this Theano. And then this describes how instead of using actual Python variables, you use Theano objects. So this is kind of a symbolic thing. So instead of x being a number, it refers to um, an object which can be manipulated symbolically. So if we then say, well, y is 3 times x squared plus 1, what's the type of y? It's yet another symbolic variable. Now, the, that symbolic variable knows its relationship to x. But if you say, well, give me the value of y, there's no value of y. It is the symbolic graph to what x, what it came from. So if we then actually look at what y is, it's an element that, that this essentially is telling you the final, it, it has essentially, you can think of y as being a tree of operations to get from x building up to the final output y. So if you ask, well, what is y is an add, because in fact, if you look at here, the final operation y is going to be add one. But if we pretty print it, this is how it thinks about it internally, that it's a constant 3 times this squared plus 1. Similarly, going through, this is a graph of what it thinks. So up until this point, and so here's a natural graph of what it thinks. So here, it, you haven't actually computed any value of y at all yet. And we haven't, I don't think we've actually created any C code. But if, if I do this line, this will take a surprising amount of time, because what it did when, when it evaluated that value of y at x, is it wrote some C++ code, which was the symbolic tree. It then put in the value of x, and then got the C++ to tell it the answer. So you can then, so, so this essentially has, shows you how this kind of symbolic thing can be implemented as it chooses, rather than as I choose. We can then make this into a function, which we can now call as, as a simple f, it will do the right thing. And here's his, now the interesting thing here is it's actually, this is how it is running this function. It's actually reorganized the tree that you saw earlier into being a particular composed kind of function, which is, um, so it's actually reorganized the tree to make it more efficient in, in, or to use operations which it knows how to do more natively. So some of the, 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 let's say, the BLAST library will define particular kinds of matrix <coughs> multiply adds really efficiently, so it should use those wherever it can. So also in Theano you've got different tensor types, where a tensor just means a vector is a one tensor, a matrix is a two tensor, a cube, which is a three-dimensional matrix, would be a three tensor. There's, so it's not really like a general relativity tensor, it's a it's just a multiple dimensional matrix. Um, you can also play, if you've used NumPy, you'll understand there are various kind of indexing tricks. You can do all of that. The, but the key thing is that this is not using the NumPy library unless you happen to be using the CPU. It can do these indexing tricks on the GPU as well. It's all completely transparent to you. Um, so there's a whole variety of stuff that you kind of might expect there to be. And then here is the kind of the big trick. What you can do is suppose I define y as being a, so x is a scalar, so this is an input, and y is log. I can then say I want gradient to be the 
um, the gradient of y respect to x and evaluate that at 2 and it knows the gradients. So the key thing, because each, each operation through the tree is a well-known operation and it knows the gradient, it can symbolically derive the gradients of every element within that tree. Um, and this is the trick which is required to make this whole thing work. Because then you can then say, well, if I know the gradients everywhere, I can apply small steps to everything. Um, and this is what, what we then start to go through. So here, here we're doing matrix operations. We can square matrices. We can then have updates. So, so th this is something which um, I, I would say the uh, this is a kind of low-level Theano thing, and it takes a while to get your head around. Um, and in particular, we, you could play with this later. If you put in a an operation which it shouldn't be able to do, like if you transpose a matrix inappropriately, but it, it, when you're actually building this thing symbolically at the beginning, it doesn't necessarily know what input shape you're giving it. It's just that only when it evaluates it at the end does it realize, oh, well, these dimensions don't match up? Because you can leave a lot of this stuff unknown and just fill in the blanks later. And then you get a, an impenetrable error message because it will complain about its own tree, which is optimized away from your code, not having the right dimensionality. And this is, so in, in all this development, you can be type, you, you type away your network, get it looking right, then you press the go button and you, if it's right, it's fantastic because it will work and it's beautiful. Um, if it doesn't, you'll be faced with a page of error messages which has actually nothing to do with your code. Or it only has like third hand to do with your code. It's like you know, your GCC producing like a machine code pop instructions wrong. So I have no idea why this instruction would ever be output um, and you can't trace it back to any particular node because it may have eliminated when it does the tree manipulations, it can do all sorts of optimizations, and it may have actually taken away some of your your nodes. You, you've no idea what's going on. Anyway, so so th there's a whole bunch of things that this can do, and in particular, they're interested in doing neural network kind of updates. And so there's th they've taken care of the uh, matrix thing, they've taken care of the gradients, they've taken care of the updating mechanism. Um, that's the very quick introduction to Theano. <coughs> OK, so now I'm going to quickly walk through, or now I'm going to get into more like, here's where you start doing it yourself. So there is a thing which I talked about earlier called MNIST. Um, it's a data set from the 80s. And it used to be considered like a, though as a major paper when this thing came out and people had good results. Now it's kind of like the hello world of neural networks. Um, if, if your network theory can't do this, then like throw away the theory. <laughs> um, so it has 50,000 28 by 28 images of these tiny little digits. Um, people used to use it as a benchmark as points. Now it's, it's, uh, it's like a hello world. Um, but I mean, very soon, ImageNet will be the hello world. And, and you know, these things move along quickly. So here you will take some input, some hidden layers, get some output. So what, what you do, the, the, ga the game here is to take an image and say, which of the 10 digits is this? And what you typically do is you have an output layer which is 10 different strengths, and then you pick the one which is the highest strength. Now, if, if you're wrong, then how do you train it? Well, you say, well, I said six and it should be eight. I should have a zero in this position. I should have a one in this position. I bend or everything, so I'm more likely to say than six. And you just do this again and again. Now, the, the thing is, you don't have to do it that much. Um, this thing will train quite quickly. So on top, what, what we have here um, is this thing. And I will step through this. Okay. What we're doing here is we're loading Theano, and then there's another library called Lasagna. Now, Lasagna is to do layers. And the reason you do this is so that you can talk to, the, to Theano instead of array, matrix operations, you can talk to it in terms of, da, da, da. so this is just loading some data. Here's the data. 
I guess this is the key. This is the key thing here. Here, I'm saying I've got an input layer, which is the, sh the same size as the image. Then I want a dense layer, and now I want to get the output. And then, so so this is a way of setting up the whole uh, thing initially. I can then say, well, my loss function, I want to have categorical cross-entropy. So it knows all about the things that typical neural network people want to do. Um, this is because I want to classify things into the right category. Um, this gets all the parameters. Um, so here, I'm setting up a training function, a validation function, and this prediction function. Um, now, the training depends on the updates. The updates depend on the gradient. So this is just using a gradient function from Theano to produce a whole bunch of updates. There's a updates SGD, stochastic gradient descent. But because it's a library designed by people who are doing cutting edge research, there are all kinds of updates. So there are momentum updates, there are Adam updates, there are um, Adder Delta, whatever. Um, so th these are, and these update things are essentially ways of making stochastic gradient descent work faster. So if you've got a pure, from a purist point of view, if you know exactly what direction is down and you take a small step, then you're doing kind of the right thing. But if you find that you're taking small steps in the same direction all the time, really you, you want to take a large step. Just And so there's a whole bunch of, of ways of guessing where you're going to go so you can leap there quicker. And so this is it used to be a huge focus of what people do. Now, people know that this stuff kind of tends to work even when you don't want it to. It's a, it used to be a big problem. Now it's flipped around, so it's, a, it's a kind of a non-issue. Um. <coughs> so finally, we're going to get to some training. And this thing is going to train like this. Now, my, my machine may be quicker, I'm not sure. Um, um, okay. it, it was not an expensive machine, particularly if you have a Mac, I'm pretty sure I'm not expensive. Okay, so th this thing, at, so this first MLP MNIST thing does not do a very good job. Um, it's, its error rate is like 8%. It's, 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 fairly terrible, um, but at least it kind of works. And this, this is showing what it knows about a zero, what it knows about a one, what it knows about a two. And you can kind of see that if my three, if I had a digit and kind of match this template, that would be a good guess. So this is, um, this is a very simple example of lasagna in combination with, um, with Theano training on MNIST. Um, And there's another one. So this is where I, I'm going to start to say, okay, now this is something you can play with. Um, there's another example called two. There's MNIST CNN. So this is instead of using, in the previous example, we were using the pixels individually. So they all kind of independent of each other. This MNIST CNN instead <coughs> says, well, let's create a convolutional network in layers um, to. To, to look at this, so we can then judge th judge which uh, class these things belong to. So what, one of the tricks here is I've chosen to have just three convolutional layers, so that I can then draw a picture of what the layers actually represent in R, G, and B. So the, the point of doing that is you can then see what to, what features are these layers picking up, and you can see that say on here, and this is where I would encourage you to go through. And, if you want to see the result, you can just press the cells run all, and you'll see how it works. Basically, you've got the green, the green layer is picking kind of the, the ups, the upside of every uh, curl here. The blue layer is picking the downs, and the reds are picking the rights. Now, the point is, once you have that information, it's much easier to run your your categorization because it's and, and the. the other important thing is it's learned this that these are important features all on its own. 
we haven't get, we've told it that this is an image, but we haven't told it it's good to look for horizontal lines and vertical lines. It's figured that out on its own. Um, so I'm going to let I'm going to leave that and not run through it. Just uh, that's worth having a look at if you can. So I'm going to describe two things which we're going to go through, um, or you're going to go through now, and so I'll, ex I'll briefly describe what's in there. Um, and then kind of you're on your own, but I will come round and if, if when people have a common problem, I'll, I'll talk about it. So, question, okay, how do we detect outliers? In all of this stuff, what we have so far is we've got some inputs and some known outputs. But the question is, particularly if you've got, um, you want to detect anomalies, it may be that you have some anomalous cases, but it's not that you want to learn what that case is, because the reality is that they're just not... The anomalies may have com completely different commonalities between them, and you may have almost no data for them. So the idea here... I mean, there's obviously other ways to do the anomaly detection. The idea here is let's figure out what good data looks like. So, But that means that everything we're looking at is basically a... This is data. And that's all the, that's the, all the training you can give it. So what people do is they say, I will, I will try and make my network produce its own input. If I can make my output, so I know that everything I give it is valid on average. Not me. Not me. I know that everything on average I give it will be valid data. So the data is itself its own training examples. Um, so you only have one label, you train the network to reproduce its own input and what you what we find is that the hidden layer so we have a network which I'll show you da -da 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 -da. So we have a network which looks like this we have because we're going to run this on MNIST we have an input layer which is a 28 by 28 image we force it through a hidden layer which is much smaller and then we make this hidden layer produce its, produce its guess at the input but the thing is, you say, well, the target values for this output layer is the input there. And so this is called an autoencoder. <coughs> and the trick is, by, by having this hidden layer sufficiently small, it has to learn, in order to make this work with, with a kind of low error, it has to learn, in general, it has to learn a generalized representation of what your data is. So then, if you have something which goes from input through the hidden layer to something which looks very different, you know it's something which doesn't match the rest of your data, which is an anomaly. So this is a very simple kind of trick to, to essentially force a neural network to learn something you, you, you thought of in the first place. Um, so there's a thing called anomaly detection, which is number eight. Now, I'm not going to run through it here. It's on your thing. It's a fairly simple neural network. It's, you can kind of understand what's going on. You could just press do all of this stuff, but there are exercises at the bottom which say, let's change a few things around. Um, you can even try and introduce <coughs> bugs and seeing what the horrible error messages you get out. Uh, this is a very simple network, it can train quite quickly, um, but it is data science. So. Another one, which is this pre-built networks thing. So you've got this image net network, uh, this pre-trained thing on the drive already. Um, what this thing has done is, is in the same way... Can I ask questions? Yes. So on the anomaly detection part, yes. uh, you have the hidden layer, which is much smaller. Yes. Is there some mechanism by which you decide how large that should be? Because if you... Yeah, <laughs> because, OK, the, 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 the thing is... Because in applications, a lot of companies will say, we have some fraud, or we have some anomalies, but it's not labeled, so we want to find them, which is kind of a... No, 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 it's, yeah. uh, <laughs> but what I, the nice thing about this example is it's very quick. It's very quick to to train it and relearn okay. it. You can set the number of hidden layers just by like pressing the delete button. Try five. My guess is five won't work so well. Um, if you, but on the other hand, if you say for five hundred, it will just learn to produce the output directly. So there's some happy medium. And so this is one of this is where people legitimately criticize the neural network stuff as kind of black magic, is that whilst you do have this stochastic gradient descent, which 
has mathematical foundation. There's also graduate gradient descent. So the idea there is you throw lots of graduate students at the problem, <laughs> and it optimizes, right? And this is why this is why also I, mean, I wouldn't say for me, but lots of <coughs> the people who do this and who come through graduate school or, or these things they're in quite high demand because they know kind of how to make these things work, and. That's kind. Of, there is an art to it. It's difficult to put your finger on. But one, it's a question of playing with it. And it's also kind of, it's like the ten thousand hour thing. That you, you just have to subject yourself to misery for quite a long time. And this is kind of a, like a hallmark of a programmer. You, programmers, people say, "Oh, I love to write code." But in fact, programmers' jobs is mainly about debugging. You have to love bugs if you're a programmer, because <laughs> because everyone writes bugs. And if if you if you're not writing you're not writing things sufficiently advanced for you if you're not writing bugs. I mean, I don't know, I don't know. Um, you've got to love debugging and hitting your head against a wall, and then you can achieve something. But, so this is why it's quite nice to play around with these, some of these pre-built things. You could add extra layers, you could, you could play around with it, see what happens. Um, but yes, seems about right, 50. I heard on the net, it seems about right. <coughs> that, that being said, I built this thing from zero, and it worked first time. So I'm like, okay, this is, this is good. And then and same goes for some of these other, all of these notebooks. Basically, the first thing I did worked, and I was relieved, and then I just left it. So, and that tends to, the people tend to be publishing the paper when it works first time, okay? when, when it works at all. <laughs> And so then, then someone comes up with, oh, I can make it work better, but you know, that's hardly a good paper. So you're, the fact that it works is so surprising at the moment. So it's like it's public. Sorry? It's like maybe very good. Yes, yes. And this is, so this is, but this is you know, a data science feature engineering kind of story. I mean, people are used, don't be surprised that you have to do the same kind of stuff for the neural networks, because you've, you're used to hand on, um, unless you do gradient boosted trees the whole time, or whatever, right? Um. <laughs> yeah, along the line, does it make sense to have multiple hidden That's, okay, so, so in some of the early days, a lot of people thought, well, the best way to train these hidden things was to train them one at a time, and to have this kind of bottleneck approach, and, <coughs> So yes, I mean, th there's a history of doing that. It is question questionable. I, I don't know. I mean, it it's a question of trying it and seeing. Um, in, in terms of the just the, in terms of network depth, people find there's people have intuitions about how deep is enough. Now the fact that this works with one is probably good enough for the problem. So I don't don't overthink it because you might overtrain the whole thing. So in a way, you try and suppress the number of parameters you have. On the other hand, you want something which works. I mean, it's like you want to make sure it does actually find an anomaly that you know. But maybe you don't ever want to tell it. You don't want to ever learn that anomaly. You just just check. But it's kind of a, a funny. You're playing a funny game when you when you optimize this structure with your validation set. So okay. Ah, okay. So sorry. On to. Onto the pre-built models. So we've got this whole ImageNet trained thing, trained on a thousand classes from ImageNet. Um, as I mentioned before, this is not necessarily commercially useful classes, but it has learned while doing this useful features for vision. So if it knows a lot about dogs, which means it probably knows how to identify fur. So in these different layers, even though you haven't told it about the different images, if you train things to recognize faces, but the first layer, it will have the picture. The next layer will identify some, some lines or some edges. Then you'll start to identify curves. Then you'll say shapes. Then you'll have like eyes and noses. And then you have faces. And this thing will look very much like what people find or want to find in the brain. And it does this completely um, un unhelped. Now, if you say, well, let's let's make it much sh shallower, this thing won't work as well. If you make it sufficiently deep, it works pretty well. The latest ImageNet thing from Microsoft actually has another trick, which is they take two layers which work pretty well. They, they train this thing so it works as well as they can with a certain layer. They then take a pair of layers and say, well, let's just tr insert more layers in between 
to learn that where I'm where I'm making errors. So it's called a residual network thing. So basically, they, they learn the residuals to try and to try and pump up the learning between these two layers. They cancel out all the residuals, so it's like a boosting kind of thing. So the the, the Microsoft, which won ImageNet most recently, is 151 layers deep. So these people just want to apply computer power and they're basically trying to win ImageNet. So it's kind of gone beyond um, what you practically use, though they, computer power is cheap. Um, sorry, could you quickly explain how you calculate a residual? So at, at every, so, so you've got these classes which are training and then you've got a layer here and a layer here which is now hidden layers and they've got, um, you, you know what error is produced at the top by the, you know, the inputs and outputs here. You say, well, how would I reduce, if I were to fix that, how would I then reduce that error? By adding extra stuff. And so if you insert a network which would initially have a random mean zero, it can then gradually bend this thing. But it has more opportunity to learn kind of a hidden structure. So where so do you insert this network? So it gr gradually, so, so you, you have, the bottom, so you have this thing, this, you essentially put it by the side, so you have this one thing which is working, you then w have an extra set of wires, which initially are kind of mean zero, and it learns how to fix this thing up, but eventually you can just look at it like it. And once it is done fixing these two layers, uh, does the fixer, do you, do you need that fixer? That yeah, yeah, that becomes another layer, which oh. is a legitimate layer, and then why not put more fixes in between it and it and it? So you kind of fract all this thing out into 150 layers. You started with five. Right? So and, and quickly, uh, what is the uh, way you find out uh, the effect of a particular layer on the final output? You can you can differentiate the whole thing. But the, okay, I have to say that one one thing about this is that this is a Microsoft paper which came out at the beginning of the year and the code is all online and it's implemented in all different libraries and you can just go and read it. I mean, the th what I've described here is takes you to have the vocabulary to do an awful lot of this stuff just by reading the paper and people just want to spread the... If you start getting into the, the autoencoder stuff then it starts getting very uh, functional um, no. it, it starts to get very uh, uh, abstruse. Whereas if you go for some of the um, the CNN stuff, just recognizing digits or, or doing language, is very much, oh, we added these layers together, we figured that if you do this, it, it tends to be kind of practical. So um, in, in a way, this is kind of shallow as a subject. Okay, so given a, an, a trained ImageNet thing, um, we can use these features which it's learnt. So it knows about dogs, it probably knows about fur. If it knows, it probably knows about eyes. It probably um, it knows about scales because it knows about fish. Um, but, it, so it knows a lot of the useful stuff about vision. But instead of choosing one particular class, we're going to apply it to stuff where we don't know any, it, it's not a pre-trained class at all. But what we find is that this last output image, this last output layer, which we're only, for the real deal, we're only looking for the top spike. The rest of it is kind of characteristic of the image as well. Um, it's called number five commerce. Oh, oh no. Oh no. There is a beautiful image here. It's on the next slide? No, no, it's not. No, no. Somewhere here. Okay, I'm sure I have it. Okay. Um, I will produce you a beautiful image. Well, while you're doing this, um, basically, instead of these thousand, these thousand values will have lots and lots of information in the non-peak values. And what you can do is you can train an SVM to recognise the difference between this set of thousand values and some other class's thousand values. So you can very simply look at images which you've never seen before, or so classes of images you've never seen before, and distinguish between them just by applying an SVM on the output instead of the one hot classification. So this is something where you go in and have a look. What I'm doing here is classifying um, cars into classic cars and modern cars. 
and you can see that there's and and this is kind of the exercises for the reader I would encourage people to try this is to try and it's, it's all done in, in a, the file directory structure such that if you create a new thing other than cards, so say for pianos, and it explains this <coughs> at the bottom of the sheet. If you create a pianos thing and say, I want to distinguish between upright pianos and grand pianos, just stuffing images in these directories will let it learn. <coughs> and if you get any nice results, please tell me, and we'll include this as a good example. I mean, um, it, but this is, I have to say, this is what the thing which worked first time. I, I kind of figured out this is what someone was doing, tried it, works first time, done. Um, so it's kind of uh, it, it kind of validates this whole uh, approach. Um, Hi, sure. So before I ask, if you just to ask, like, why from a integration perspective, why do you use SPF over other binary classifiers? Is it because like, SPF always tries to maximize the hyper margin, or like, why do SPF over other binary um, I guess this goes to more like being as lazy as possible. Okay. <laughs> I think Psychic Learn had SVM, where I could type in SVM, and it would just find the difference. So uh, it was um, the the thing is between these these, these thousand parameter vectors, I, I don't know anything about the structure of the of what they are identifying, other than pro probably there's stuff which responds well to in particular for the cars, it loves wheels I think so it's probably something which is more character which has more wheels, and other things has more angly lines. So if I'm interested in wheels, there'd be lots of wheeled things or lots of eyes. It may, it may think that it may be identifying wheels as being eyes, whereas the modern cars have more spokes, so a, it may think those are flowers. So the space which it's identifying as this last layer has nothing to do with cars per se, but it can distinguish between what it knows about vision pretty well. <coughs> SVM I chose just because it was quick, quick to do. Um, but it's, it's difficult to distinguish that between any other method. It is particularly, um, I think the class is it's going to be easy. It's a thousand dimensional, so it's going to be easy to draw a linear line. So, so. Good morning. For the features being trained uh, in the car data set, yes. then a new car data set, now yeah. we are applying a new SVM and try to identify on the vintage car set. Yes. But can uh, similar like dogs? Distinguish dogs to cats, uh, cats and dogs. Oh, dogs and cats is easy because it knows some cat. It obviously knows ca tabby cat and it yeah, knows can dogs. We use the dogs data set to train a CNN model. Then I apply it on cars. This is precisely what we're doing here. So we're using the pre-trained thing, which is trained on all the thousand classes of ImageNet, which is primarily dogs and flowers. I mean, there may be some machinery in there, but. Um, and then we're using its output about its preferences in terms of how much like a husky dog this car looks. And in, in some ways, the SVM would distinguish maybe husky dog, the husky dog dimension is not relevant to this. And then it's equally spaced between the modern and old cars. So that means in but order to reuse the models, we have to train it using versatile data sets. Kind of yes, it, it, it's, it's, hel it's, hel it's, so it's helpful it's that. Right. Yeah. So you can Im imagine that the ImageNet itself is not particularly helpful because they've done a spread of stuff and really specific dog stuff just to try and see wh what areas this is. You can imagine if you had a commercially trained model, what you'd want is to pick uniformly across the English language classes which could identify all sorts of different stuff and then. Release and then then spend a long time training a model which was good had good versatility in that sense, um, but but it, on the other hand you need a ton of data to do that you need resources to head towards that so if I were doing this on like in a commercial setting I'd say let's just do what we have we can pick off the shelf and get it running today and then decide whether we need to have more information about like have really thousands of images of clothes, for instance, that we, we then have more knowledge about what to look for in a collar. Whereas here it's probably looking at collars as being, you know, some kind of plumage, right? So, so it, it's, it's entirely possible that you might want a bigger, the big network to be trained on something more relevant to your data. On the other hand, this is kind of a neat trick, um, which is, we like, I like neat tricks.
moreover, this worked first time. So if we had, we had this is just training on 10, 10 old cars, 10 new cars, and it seems to work. And you should have fun with that. Now, what another thing, before I, okay. I can talk about, but let me, before I talk about fancy tricks, okay, this is kind of fancier trick that people use to translate language. And that the people will have, in the bottom you'll have your input sentence as being, economic growth has slowed down in recent years. Up above, la croissance économique, c'est bien, c'est bien, whatever. Um, it's very, it's actually tough to see how you would do this. Right, because there's some word flipping going on, there's some adjective agreement, this is French. Um, but this is, basically you can have, this is a diagram which shows re current neural networks going this way and backwards. And then you have a thing which comes up and then decides where it should be apparent, where this network should be applying attention to get its results to feed into this network, which is recurrent, which then produces these words. So this whole thing is some crazy mess of stuff which is directing attention, which is some kind of weighting vector. Um, but the key thing is this whole thing can be differentiated. Therefore, we can train it. So you just put in parallel texts of English and French, and this thing converges to a crazy extent. Um, so crazy extent. And, and, but for that, you need one of these things. And we have a guy here who will now talk about the GPU. What, what is it? But I would also encourage people to start opening, looking at the analogy and the, the either choose the analogy thing to understand, which is a simpler example. Well, they're both simple in their own ways. So the analogy thing, the commerce thing, this guy can talk about his GPU box. Okay. <coughs> Okay. Yeah, sure. What do you want? Do you want, want this? Want this one? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm surprised it works actually. Because this is a special <coughs> ace. It's actually an ace. Um, <coughs> oh! Can you introduce yourself? Oh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Hui Han, and I'm currently a researcher at DSO National Labs. So today I'm going. To, uh, so Martin has talked about like deep learning stuff, and he alluded a point that you need a GPU at some point if you really want to do serious training. And some of you might think that you no know, GPUs are like those server, big server racks that you have to go on Amazon EC2 to get an instance to run your deep learning stuff. But actually, no. You can actually build this box, for example. And it has a GPU, a full-fledged GPU, which can do all your deep learning stuff. How much did that cost? Huh? <laughs> so uh, this is a 970. Uh, I can go through. A, uh, I'm going through the pricing later. So this is a 970 <laughs> GTX. It costs about four hundred dollars. Yeah. And the the, re the this setup is interesting. Uh, okay. So right now, right, I, I'm going to demonstrate that this box itself is running the notebook, uh, which you'll be doing anyway. And what I'm going to do now is that I'll, the, the motivation of building this box. Uh, okay, so hang on. Okay, that was. <coughs> so we wrote an article on KD Nuggets uh, here that describes how it was being done. Hang on, let me show you the back end. Okay, the real motivation to do this is because uh, I, I do deep learning at work and I have uh, my own GPU clusters with of racks of uh, Titan X and Kepler cards. So Titan X is for development, but then once they are done, they go to the server side and they run on K40s, K80s for months. But then I want to do some deep learning at home and I realized I need a full card because the CPU just doesn't cut it. So we came up with this box design and then <coughs> For those of us who sometimes need to run on data set which we cannot put on the cloud because of privacy or due to NDA, this box comes in handy. So that was actually the primary motivation. So uh, these are all prices in USD. 
And the reason why we chose this form factor is because it's small enough that we can carry in the back. Actually, it was designed for computer gamers where they have like a LAN party, bring your own computer. So we took all the parts for computer game gamers. We chose the form factor in such that the cut all fit nicely into this. So actually, these are pictures of the inlets. Uh, and then the GPU itself, and this is how it looks like. So everything slots in nicely. Okay, one thing bad about this design I need to tell up front is that the heat density is very high. So if you're running this for overnight, you have to take another fan to put on top. But we find it's okay because when you're training, how often do you train a uh, network? I mean, if you are running this for more than a week, then I recommend you run on uh, Amazon EC2 instance. But if you're just running for overnight, then just using a small desk fan is fine. Your car will not burn up. So I've, I've burned many, many GPUs by running for one month and they, they do catch fire, so. <laughs> yeah. So it's just a pro tip is that, uh, oh, for those of us, right, the, the GPU is actually rated to run about 90 degrees Celsius to about 99 around that region, but that's not recommended. 70 is a recommended range, but your PCI connectors inside are not rated to go up to 90. So from time to time, if there's vibration, the connectors might touch the cut and they will melt. And when they melt, and they will catch fire. You know? And it will just melt, actually. It's not a bad idea. There's no flame. But you get burned components after a while. So if you're ever doing anything serious, uh, run on the server setup. Okay, and then, so this is how it looks like. And uh, yeah, the prices, the prices are here. And okay, now how do you talk to this box right now? Okay, I'll just apply it. So you notice this is one of those machines that Martin was talking about that has no uh, no display ports or whatnot. Uh, you can see there's like no cable that's running in. And I can, the way I talk to this box is purely via Ethernet. And I use a secure shell to talk to it. So usually what I'll do is I'll just chuck this box at the corner of my house and then I'll run my stuff. I'll put this into my home network and I run it off my home network. So, so I'll show you how to talk to the box. Uh, I use a uh, net firewire. Uh, and Adapter. Yeah. So you put your code and the data to SSH2? Yeah. To, to this box, yeah. And then? Uh, you can actually do it a few ways. So one way you can do it, everything on this box, data, code, everything on this box. Or the other way is you can do, just in time, just transfer via SSH, run it, and then it pull it back. But it's a bit slower, but yeah. So I'm just going to SSH into my box. And so uh, we're gonna run the the Jupyter notebook as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Command pass. Command pass. Yeah. 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 No, don't do it. The terminal just you, you should have been seeing the terminal. I just show you how to log in, and then we will switch over to the GUI. That's nicer. Uh. So, yeah, yeah, I run a GPU So now this is what you all should be getting on your own machine, right? Yeah. And I'm running X forwarding. So the this, this is actually uh, my Firefox. So it's transferring the image to my Mac itself. And similarly, you all have, you all have all the notebooks for today, right? Like here, I can run the CNN example. So it looks exactly like your stuff. So it's running the code right now. I guess I should point out that the mm -hmm. this this stuff is not at the at the moment it's not using his GPU at all. Yeah, yeah, it's not using it's Python GPU. producing this code. Right. The CUDA and then it's compiling and da da da. But when it gets to this compile and train. That's when it flips over. So then it's done. So it's yeah. exactly your example in the notebook. Okay, the. Um, yeah. How does it know that only that uh, block of code for training needs to be run on the GPU? Okay, so if you're using Tiano, when you there is an options file that says uh, GPU zero. In, you just put it in. Whenever you run any code, if it detects a GPU, it will switch over and then run it. Yeah, and it's totally transparent to you. You never have to tell that you have a GPU. You need to install some drivers? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so you need to go through the whole stack. Uh, so it's here. So 
So the one I, I use, I'm using is uh, an, on NVIDIA, so I use CUDA and this is my setup. So you can ignore the, the last slide level framework, I'll show you frame, uh, digits later. So the way the GPU works is that you can't directly talk to the GPU itself, there is a few layers you need to talk. So the, the physical card itself is the, the NVIDIA GTX 970, you need to run the driver, which on top is a computational toolbox, which is CUDA, and then you need to run the, G, the deep learning tools you are using. So it can be TNO, TensorFlow, CAFE, it sits above that. And then finally, <coughs> the applications goes on, way on top. So you have to do through everything. And but one thing really bad about, uh, personally I feel about the, the NVIDIA support for Linux machine is that they tend to be pretty brittle. So they tend to break with every update. So like this morning it actually broke. So I was in a panic for like 8 to 9.30, <laughs> going through all the patches and stuff like that. Uh, yep. So usually what people do is that they will find one thing that works for them and they just stop it there and freeze it until the next major LTS come about. So those of you who are exploring uh, this stuff, right? Uh, if you're using Ubuntu 16.04, right, we are facing a lot of problems. So consider just, just hanging around 14.04 for a while. <laughs> yeah. Uh, even NVIDIA themselves recommend 14.04, even though 16.04 is the latest LTS for Ubuntu. Okay. So can okay, we read the key nuggets on how to do that? Uh, so uh, the notebook that you guys have, right, the data set is actually pretty uh, customized or optimized to be running on a CPU, so you don't actually see much effect. So uh, actually I actually brought along another uh, another example, which is NVIDIA Digits. So I'm not here to sell NVIDIA Digits, I mean, <laughs> everyone has <laughs> different views of that, but I'm just showing that if you run a GPU and I think we can run the GPU to see the effect. Maybe I'm trying to, try to make the thing sound really loud. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, no fire. <laughs> no fire. Okay. Let me run my Facebook. Uh, my Facebook uh, experiments. Okay, I just <coughs> draw. Okay, I think I can just run. So okay, then you can see the GPU utilization. Let's see the temperature climb up. Okay, I'm not trying to. So, uh, so anyway, this is a very huge data set. It's a uh, 60 gigabytes of Facebook images. Yeah. Well, I, I can't tell you what is it for, but <laughs> so this is one of my customer use case. You bring the box to the customer, you give you the data, you just run it, and you don't need to know what's going to happen. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about this front end that you're using? Oh, this is NVIDIA Digit. So it's uh, designed by NVIDIA. It's riding on top of Cafe. So what it does, it has uh, all the uh, stuff set up nicely for you. For example, you can create data sets let's say you have a task say classification, you need to just pass it the fold, the, the path to the folder which contains all your data, and it will, it will do nicely for you the partitioning of it into the test validation train. You can even do all sorts of pre-processing like rescaling, subtract the mean, and all these are done uh, asynchronously and non-blocking, so you can carry on doing your other stuff. So you just uh, let it run in the background and do everything nicely for you. So it's like really uh, like the lazy man way of doing things and it offers you a other kind of uh, features as well. So when you're designing a model, uh, one thing you can do is for example, you can like select basic networks that you have, uh, there's the, the famous networks like Google Net that was being mentioned already, or you can, let's say, take this net and then we try to customize it. They also provide tools such as visualization, then you can see how the network looks like. Exactly. Okay. So oh, most of the setting for cafe is already up in the front end. You just need to either select default and uh, change it. And if you really want to do customization on the network itself, it offers you an option as well. You can just modify it here. So this is in a cafe Google photo bar format. So you can describe the network. Personally, if you are really serious about deep learning, this is not the way to go. So usually what we do is we run this and we have a lot of interns, right? And we just, we give them all the networks that we need and we just let the interns go and figure out what is the optimal learn rate best and everything. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the good thing is this is running off uh, 
a web server. So you never need to expose your underlying part to the, the, the interns or the unauthorized user. They just do everything via the interface itself. Yeah. Because unlike your Jupyter Notebook, right, the, you have, the reason why I'm running this way rather than using a, a web page from my Mac and then connect to it, right, is because Jupyter allows code execution. So you can't actually run it easily. Uh, it means you cannot run it non-local. If you run it non-local, you need to enable a lot of securities before you do that. Yeah, because I can actually take control of your machine via the Jupyter Notebook. Just in case you're wondering why it's not that. Okay, it looks like it's really getting noisy. Let's see. <laughs> okay, let's take a look. Uh, let's Oh right, it's the temperature is utilizing the most <laughs> higher percent. But anyway, this one, uh, uh, I can this this data set I ran about like more than a day. It doesn't really work that well. So it's it's trying to uh, identify. I mean, just a really abstract. So I try to identify people political uh, affiliation based on their Facebook profile pages. <laughs> yeah. Did you find him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Someone <laughs> who's interested in this. <laughs> Turns out to be a really hard problem. But there's only a certain class that we can identify pretty easily. <laughs> yeah. Okay, anyway, that's, that's all for the demo. So uh, I guess you all have the notebook. You all can have fun playing with the Jupyter notebooks in the meantime. So any questions regarding this? Uh, I need to stop this. You can, can smell it's getting really hot. <laughs> you can smell it, right? No, I, uh, okay. I, I can smell it. <laughs> okay, let me stop this before it catches fire. Yes. Ah, but the good thing is that this saves checkpoint as well. So one thing that you, uh, as as you learn, as you do deep learning, right, it's important that you save the the checkpoints at the every epoch, because things will go wrong, like your machine will die or so on. So, yeah, catch fire. So having the checkpoint saved out is pretty important. Yeah. Uh yes, it will. And because you have the checkpoint saved, let me show you like, how does the checkpoint look like. <coughs> okay. Uh, so when you have a checkpoint saved, right? Like all these are the checkpoints, right? You can actually re restart the training as at that point in time. Because like if you, we hear, a lot of the re today, right? When we do like deep learning training, or like CNN, Google, and all this. No one actually trains them from scratch anymore from random weights. What we will do is they write the architecture, they will take the pre-trained weights from Google Net or Microsoft Net and they just put the weights in and then they carry on training from then on. So similarly, if you already have trained maybe 200 epoch and you have a checkpoint safe, you just need to take those weights, put it in and you can carry on training. Yeah, after the fire, yeah. It would be good, good business to sell the parameters and the training weights. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Okay, that's uh, any questions for this little box? So uh, the most common question I have, I just I just give my last comment. The most question common uh, question I have on uh, online forums is that where is the break even point for this type of setup and getting a EC2 instance? So we did the math, right? Uh, so if you want to run a deep learning problem for one month or more, then you should go for EC2. Anything less, maybe you go and play around with one or two days, then. Uh, this kind of personal setup will work fine. Yeah. I run what you mean. So if you want to train a model, okay. if your model requi training requires for total time is about one month, you do the math and the cost you pay, uh, this, this is about the break-even point. Yeah. So we do routinely run training that goes more than a month. Yeah. So usually for our case, what we'll do is we'll, do a, <coughs> we'll sample, sub sample the data, maybe get into about 10 gigabytes, put into this box, design a network, see its performance. When it's good enough, then we throw it to our clusters to run, to do whatever you need to do here. Yeah. Okay, uh, is there any question? Any questions? If not, then... Thanks.
Okay, so just a, a couple, few minutes more. Um, so I'll explain how this, given one of these, if you run it just under burning temperature, then you can do this kind of stuff um, and learn to translate languages. Um, if I can just, uh, just quickly, we've already seen Google on that as being an image processing thing. And this is all the components you need for image labeling. So this is, it's crazy, but it works. Um, this, is the same, this is the same as we saw before. They've taken a whole bunch of images which are labeled, found, presented each of these to the Google Net or similar thing to get the initial vector. And they say, we're using that initial vector, I want to produce that sentence. And done that hundreds of millions of times. And it produces decent labeling. And, uh, so now the next co the next competition, the, the next generation of competition after ImageNet could be, let's caption these things properly. Or there's all sorts of other games, higher level games people want to play. Um, now that ImageNet seems to be asymptotically getting to as good as humans. And the thing is, once you get as good as humans, what does it mean to be better than humans? Because you're, you're, you're actually competing against a crowd of humans at that point, because the guy's going to disagree with you as much as you... You, you Sorry, agree, can uh, I? Question. How do you know when to end this uh, uh, array of LSTMs? Ah, because the, the last element it will produce is stop the sentence. So you have, you have, they have, well, there's kind of, either, either you make this like the initial state, or you say, okay, I have a start the sentence symbol, series of words, which will be, I have a vocabulary of, say, 50,000 words. So the output of this thing, this will be, one, a number from 1 to 50,000 of my current word, but we then translated via something like a word embedding, which you have word to vec or something which produces this. So the word to vec you can learn from text without any uh, any other signals. So you pass this, this one number through a word to vec kind of thing, you run an LSTM with its hidden states derived from here. This will give you 1 to 50,000 50, intensities of the next word, you pick the best word, and you start again. It may be that you do it in, say, a greedy fashion where you just pick the highest word, or maybe you run it a few times, you pick several of the slightly less likely words, and then see what sentences come out, which would be more like a beam search. Um, but there's a whole, you know, there's a whole bunch of people doing this kind of cool stuff because they want to label images. Um, I, I, I don't upload that many images, so I'm not that concerned. But to label the image by individual words or it's like a short paragraph? To this is, so it's a paragraph. So the words it will spew out will be a person riding on a motorcycle on a dirt road. It is for me. My thing doesn't know anything. Um, so yeah, so it, it, does, it knows nothing about the structure of the English language other than it knows what people write in captions and what, what people have done, they've run word to vec on a huge corpus but that, the word to vec on a huge corpus may tell you about parts of speech implicitly, we don't really know what's going on um, but that gives it enough that it can string together these words into something which looks meaningful and is, you know high probability what a pro proper person would have written. What? Well, some of these, and then it gets worse. So, wrapping up. Deep learning may deserve some hype, again. Okay. Getting the tools in one place is very helpful, because one of the things about this virtual box thing <coughs> is that it, setting this stuff up is, is a bit of a labor, um, particularly when you start to get to the GPUs. You've got NVIDIA gives you this huge blob of code which is not open source, and that's kind of a sort of point. Um, so the question is, can do, do all the libraries agree? Um, the Linux people can't see what NVIDIA really needs, so your C compilers may be getting out of step. It becomes a bit of a black art setting up these things. Um, having everything in one place is useful, so and this is why it's nice to have a, a notebook which is ready to go. Um, you'll find quickly, if you want to do more complicated stuff, having a GPU is very helpful. If you like this stuff, 
please start my GitHub account. <laughs> oh, so this project, this project. Um, if you have, if you take this at home, take this home, and you play around with it, you find a problem or it needs more explanation, put an issue on here, and I can fix it up. Um, rather than complain on Meetup, best to do it here, and then we can keep track track of everything. And that's it. <coughs> Now I, I will be sticking around here until I kind of we get chucked out. So it, if you if you want to play around with it, I'll be around. Um, and if there are any questions or where? Um, okay. Um, one minute. Let's thank Martin and Hui Han for sharing with us. Also, Martin, have you gotten all your USB back? Ah, good question. So, going on to any extra USB oh, 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 oh. Them down. We're missing two white ones yeah. and six yeah. black ones. So, um, like, like Martin said, I think black we can also be hanging around. Uh, <laughs> please feel free to ask them any questions you want. Um, I understand people are really shy about the questions in the forum. So, I see. Other than that, I think that's it. That's it for today's meetup. Thank you for coming down on Saturday at 10 a.m. in such nice weather for us to stay away. Thank you, guys.